This is Jimmy DeVita, who is a core company actor, also an author, a playwright, a director, a novelist, um, a man who wears many hats and all of them well. Um, and today we're going to sort of, if you've been to these play talks, we have lots of different ways in. And I always look for an opportunity to ask Jimmy questions about his work. And I do it on my deck sometimes, and now I'm going to do it in front of you um, for a little bit. And then we'll open up to some questions, because I'm sure there's some questions that you all in the audience would like to ask him as well. But I'd love to start with Jim. Yes. And I gave him no heads up, so he has no idea what's coming at him. I'm not nervous. Uh, to, to start as far back as we can about what was your first introduction to this play? Like, when did Hamlet, the character, the story, the play, enter your consciousness as a young person, as a young actor? Hello. Is this working? Yeah. And Hello. straight up and down, I hear from Hannah, is better than... Oh, straight up and down. Because the batteries start to... Sorry. Hi, hi everybody. <clears throat> um, well, this may sound weird, but I, I first... I read Hamlet when I was nine years old. And I'm not any kind of savant. Can you... Is this not working? OK, a little closer? Thank you. I don't know how to use these things. We don't allow mics on the hill, and we never will. Um, but, um, so I'm not any. Use your projection. Yeah. But I'm, I'm no kind of savant. We, we, when I grew up in the 70s, so there were these comic books called um, Classic Comics. You guys remember those? And that's where I read Moby Dick and, and oh, Robert Louis Stevenson stuff. And I, rem I remember to this day, and I actually bought it, a copy for my cast just because I thought it was fun. And I remembered the cover, which was a ghost on top of a castle and a guy with a sword. And when you're nine years old, and you know, it was like Archie Comics or that. And I was just intrigued by this. And I loved classic comics. And you know, I, I became an actor late in life. I didn't start until I was about 25. So I was trying to figure, when did I ever start being interested in this stuff? And I think it was classic comics. And uh, so for a kid, you know, it was just a ghost and a sword. It looked really cool. But I do remember there was also, there was a guy sitting on a throne, this Hamlet guy, and it was to be or not to be, you know, in one of those little thought clouds, yeah. and then dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my very first um, um, introduction to it, and I'm sure I didn't understand anything. It was kind of a, just a cool revenge tragedy, which I think the play actually is, is masked as a typical revenge tragedy, and it's not. Um, but that's kind of, the, I feel like that's the conceit the evening is hung on a little bit. And then the other time, I was, I was about 15, again, I still wasn't an actor, and I was leaving my house to go to a wedding, I remember. And there was something playing on the TV, and I stopped to watch it for some reason. And it was this guy, and he, was, he was, had a sword over his head, and he was yelling, and I didn't know what it was. It looked really intriguing, and I don't know why, it was kind of poetic. And I was just kind of entranced for a while because I remember my dad was saying, come on, we got to go. And, I, and then I turned it off. And then later on, I looked up what it was. And it was Derek Jacobi doing the Rogan Peasant Slave speech from Hamlet, which was the first speech I ever memorized when I did want to become an actor to audition. Of course, foolish. To, you know, as, you <laughs> just know, that, that old thing. My gosh, you know, I couldn't even talk and I was memorizing Hamlet. But I, again, I, don't, I was just fascinated by... Um, I, I don't know what I was fascinated by, to be honest with you. These words, this poetry, this, and uh, Derek Jacobi, who still is in my heart, you know, I'm fascinated by him as, a, as an actor in his life. And those were all things before I even became interested in acting at all. I didn't start to leave the boats till I was 22 in community college, so. But there was something there. There was something about the language and the poetry, and the, there's something magical about it, and something I c couldn't quite get my hands on either. And I just wanted to know more about it, I think. That the, well, it sounds like swords were central to your Yeah, swords were really cool. Yeah, I, you know, again, like, I'm, I was no, you know, genius. I like the swords. They look really cool. And a, a ghost. You got a ghost story. And so, and Hamlet has all of that in it, in, too. And a lot of times we, we, I think we forget that. And mm -hmm. we just want to get to the deeply psychological. It's actually really a cool, it's, it can be a political thriller. It can be a you know, a murder mystery, because if you, th I love thinking about the people that saw this play for the first time. Spoiler alert, you know, Claudius, we have no idea who killed the king, really, you know, and uh, so to try and go back, I call it the naive listener, we can put ourselves back to the time of being, not knowing anything, and that's kind of how I direct, too, I have to keep saying, what, what if I never saw this play before, ever, 
I have never heard the word Hamlet before. So the first time somebody says the line with Hamlet's name, nobody's ever heard that before. And I try to, tra try to train myself, and I, I kind of direct that way, but, um, so that we're serving this up new for the first time. Ken um, Albers, I remember, famously said, Romeo has not read the end yeah. of this play. He hasn't read the play. He has I not was, read the play. I was a very young Romeo, and uh, I was not being particularly successful in rehearsals. And uh, a director who wound up being my mentor throughout my life, but he called me to the side. And I guess I was particularly jaded, Romeo, he said, too. And he said, Jimmy, Jimmy, come here. He says, Romeo hasn't read the play. <laughs> he said, Romeo doesn't know he's in a tragedy. Because <laughs> it could all work out. It could all work out to the very end of the play. And that's what he wanted as a really brilliant director was to keep this hope alive throughout the play. And that's the heartbreak. Not that we know we're in a tragedy from the top of the play. And uh, so he was, he was a brilliant director. We lost him just a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Ken was very central to Jimmy and Brenda being here. Jimmy. Yeah, Came Ken, Ken at brought Ken's, me here. Ken's invite in to 19, do his Romeo. 1995. I'd love to talk about, um, if you would, the me even at APT, the many ways that you have intersected with this play and how you're able then to keep beginner's brain or first time listening, first time learning as a director. So you played, one of my first seasons here actually, played Hamlet with, with David Frank directing. I to, yeah, I got to do Hamlet. Is that how long? That's a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Um, still, I think I looked a little old for the part, too. I think I stopped, I've not read a review in 22 years, but I, I, I remember one of the last ones I read, they said, I looked, the, my wrinkles looked like I was coming out of a bar in daylight. <laughs> <laughs> I think other than that, it was a good review, I think. So, uh, so I'm I not wrong. You're I stopped right? reading them from now on. Yeah, um, yeah um, but, but as your, that, was that the first time you entered into the story as an actor, when you did Hamlet here? Yes, that was the first time. Um, I'd, st I'd studied him and watched, you know, um, I, I watch everything as an actor. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I think something like Hamlet is hard enough. It's like I will watch anything and listen to anybody's performance and I will watch high school productions. Um, any inkling or idea that I can get that can help, you know, reveal something of the play or give it more clarity, I'm, I'm not above using. It's like that's... Um, so, and I, I love that. I, I love gathering, we call it like a gathering, writers call it a gathering of permissions. So it's not stealing, it's actually just seeing what this one artist did with that. And my God, that makes so much sense. And if we can get that story clear and authentic, I think that's the goal. And it's not really about who came up with the idea. Um, and plays as, as, as dense and as difficult as a play like Hamlet or many, many plays. Um, I'm just like, we'll take all the help we can get. You know. And both of those directors, your other experience, in my, my, to my knowledge, here at APT for this audience was Claudius in John Langs' production when yeah. Matt Schwader played himself. So those are two very different visions, two very different ways into telling the story that you had the experience on stage before you entered into your own way of storytelling. Yeah. Did you pull, what did you pull from those directors or productions? Or did you? I did you ignore I them don't entirely? I know that I did. If, if, cause I would joke with my Hamlet because he knows I've done Claudius and Hamlet, so I, I cut off the nervousness by saying, well, when I did Hamlet. <laughs> so, um, I just say, to, honestly, what I used from those productions were things that I was not satisfied with. Those are the things in my mind a lot going into this. And I told Hamlet in the cast that if I ever do mention another place, because like, I was never happy with that fourth act. Like, what's, when he comes mm -hmm. back to England, I just didn't get that. I was never happy with certain moments in the play. Or like, why was Polonius, if he's like this, why that? So I was, more of things that were just, um, I didn't feel successful at, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And I don't feel like as a negative, something as large as Hamlet, you know, you, you, you do the best you can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a mammoth undertaking. So, um, and there's always things like a writer too, I read a book, you know, that I, I wrote, of course, something on the first page I would change. Yeah. But that's where I was at that point in my life. I did the best I could. And I feel like that about plays, too. Um, as soon as I see something, it's like, oh, wow. Or I'll see another Hamlet next year and say, oh, my God, that's brilliant. Why didn't I I miss that? that. Yeah. Can, uh, talk about this production. I'd love to move away from the before and into the now. When you started to discuss what elements of this story you were looking to heighten in this version, because there's always so much in a play this dense. So when you got together with your design team, 
which include Takeshi Kata, you have a long relationship with, mm -hmm. who did scenic design, and Andre Plus, who did music, who's been with us Brilliant. several times, Danielle Tyler Matthews did the costumes, and they did the costumes for our Oedipus and also Scottish mm -hmm. play, and lighting was Jason Fassel, yeah. Yeah. first time on the hill. And so can we talk a little bit about and how Sarah the... Becker, my, uh, oh, and Sarah Becker, and our extraordinary coach. voice and text coach, yeah. um, was also on the team. And so to talk to me a bit about this world building with that group of, of extraordinary artists. Um, yeah, it's, it's always... I mean, I've been living with this play. Well, we were supposed to do it in 2020, so I was really started seriously in 2018. But we've been thinking about Nate mm -hmm. for six, seven years, mm -hmm. you know, like... Watching him grow as a young actor, he's a brilliant actor, and uh, just watching him and say he's he's got a Hamlet in him, and so this has been in play for a long time. <clears throat> but like with any play, I mean, as as a director, you, I call it like, what do you want to lean into in the play? Because there's a play as as with as many themes and as as rich as Hamlet, you can. You can lean into the revenge tragedy part of it. You can make it a political thriller. You can really lean into the politics of this play into the war politics with Fortinbras and Norway. Um, you can really lean into, the, you can take a very a very psychological approach to it, really focusing on Hamlet and his inner thoughts. And, um, and I think why great play, they speak to me as a director, I'm, I'm the guy or you know, the, whoever's doing it or the woman and what speaks to me now in this day and age. I don't think about that, it's just so. So it's a long way of saying, I was really interested in family in this play, more the domestic. So, and you got to cut a play like this. You know, it's four and a half hours or so without cutting. And as dedicated as we are, we don't want people going home at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so where do you cut? So, you know, I was thinking, well, what are the things I'm interested in? I was less interested in the kind of geopolitical world of the play. It's fascinating, and that's in there. Of course, you could really lean into that. But I was talking to Carrie and, and Brenda at first. I said, and it sounds kind of pedestrian and not very sexy, but I wanted, I wanted moms and dads and sons and daughters in the play. I was really interested in, who's Polonius? Like, I wanted a dad. And um, for the queen, I wanted a mom whose son is ill. And I call it like acting 101. Let's get back to the thing, stop being the iconic Hamlet. And, you know, I just, she has a son that somebody thinks they have a mental illness. Like the, the actuality of that. Um, so I was really interested in getting uh, mothers and sons and uh, fathers into the play. And I got a little off that. I'm sorry. You're talking more about the design team. No, all, I mean, it's a um, fascinating conversation. So let's sure lean into that. Not sure how I got on that, but yeah. Well, because those are the things you wanted to lean into. That's yeah. supported by your design team. If that's the story you're telling. Yeah, so that's when I, because you, you sit down and with your design team and they're these very brilliant designers and artists, which know the play probably be better than you. And I, I'm always still... I don't think that's Well, true. I'm just... Well, no, I they mean, know, sometimes, they, but not Jimmy and Hamlet. Well, they know it from a way like a musician knows music. Mm -hmm. like, I they don't know their know, line. I don't know that world. So uh, Dre, who's just brilliant, hears, hears a play in music and sound, and I'm fascinated by that. And uh, Tak, my designer, you know, I, I don't know what's going to go on in his brain or how he's going to get this set, which I think it's a brilliant set. Um, which really speaks to the play. So I have to start talking about something in that first design meeting when you're sitting alone. And I, I'm, I never have like, I, this is the way I see a set or I think it should be this guy. I just start talking about what I think about the play or what's speaking to me. What was speaking to me was family. Um, and this young man, and, and the, the thing that I led with the design team, I said, um, there was, I, I kept coming back to this one line uh, that Polonius, not Polonius, excuse me, Claudius, Claudius mm -hmm. says to Hamlet, Hamlet is grieving for his, for his father's death. And if we've, any of us who've lost a parent or father, we know what that's like. It's a long time. I mean, and uh, so Hamlet's grievance in the, the second scene of the play, and the king says that that's unmanly grief. It is unmanly grief to, to grieve like that. I was just kept on being intrigued by unmanly grief, that it's not, it's wrong for this young man to grieve the death of his father. And Polonius says, you know, this... <clears throat> this, you know, you've been doing it just for this enough already. It's been two months, you know, and he's saying, um, so I, for some reason I have no idea why. That just kept on coming, unmanly grief, unmanly grief. And then I was kept on seeing all these words in the play. What is a man, you know, of his chief good? What, you know, what is a man? 
uh, Hamlet says of his father, who was a man taken for. So I was just in, in, intrigued by what is what is the definition, what is the expectation of a man uh, in this in this story, um, and which echoes a lot of stuff that's going on in the world today. I think that's why it spoke to me. You know that I didn't consciously do that, but but yeah. What what is our um, what do we expect of man? What is manhood? What does that mean? And so those are the questions I was putting forth to the cast and. Uh, I mean, to the design team. And then I eventually said, I said, what if, I'm, I'm making this up, you know, it's not like in the play, like this is what, she, but these things are in the play. Um, so I said, what, is, what if this is a, is a kingdom where there, there is an expectation of a certain kind of masculinity? And uh, what are the pressures of that on a young man that is not particularly of that ilk? So the play starts, you know, we have Hamlet is tasked with revenging the death of his father so right away, he's, his inheritance going into this play is to revenge, to, to a death for a death. Um, and I was just trying to really think about that and in the context of, my, you know, like, is that a good thing? <laughs> you know, is that what, you, you know, somebody said, where's the justice in this play? And I don't think there is justice in this play. Um, Hamlet takes, eventually takes matters into his own hands and, and a lot of innocents died because of it. So in that way, Hamlet is, um, I don't see it as his crystal clean hero. You know, he does some very, <laughs> some things that are not so nice in this play. And there's, um, so I was, I was just intrigued. I was intrigued. What, what is the, what are the pressures on Hamlet um, to revenge his father's death, to be a man like, you know, to be a man like Fortinbras, to be a man like Laertes in a more traditional sense. And if he doesn't quite fit into that traditional iconic expectation of what manhood means. Um, so I talked about that to the design team. I said, well, what's that pressure on Hamlet like that? And, and they started to dream about that. And that's where mm -hmm. Dre started to dream about this, I wouldn't say music, sound that is in the play to support that. The set very much uh, reflects that. I, I mean, that's a lot of steel. There's yeah. a lot of metal up in A lot of steel and grating, and we wanted something heavy. And I, I didn't say that. These are the words that, you know, talk comes up with. I just wanted pressure on Hamlet. I said, whenever we can put pressure on Hamlet or Ophelia in the play, too, because I wanted a lot of pressure on her. Um, and those kind of the, the general ideas that I start talking about with them, and they just run with their imaginations, and they're a fascinating team. Can we talk and about, since you brought up Laertes and Ophelia, a little uh -huh. bit about, and you talked about fathers and sons and daughters and parents, and the, what I think one of, those, uh, one of the elements of this production that is unique is the Polonius family, if you've seen this play before or have a history with this play, some of us have an idea of who Polonius is, and it's often portrayed as sort of a bumbling old fool. Um, mm. And this is a very different, well, it's Chike Johnson. And that's yeah. not, I mean, I've had people say Chike's playing Bobo and Polonius. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'd love to talk about the Polonius family and, and what those well, ideas were. I was intrigued because I've been in, and I've seen every production, I think, that's on film or everything you can. Um, and Polonius, it's, it's a very valid way to approach Polonius, and I think it's probably what Shakespeare intended, too. He's a, a little more daughter, you know, brevity is the soul of wit. He's, he can be very funny, and I'm not averse to humor, and Shike gets quite a bit of humor in it, too, which is uh, wonderful. Um, but I wanted a really capable statesman and a dad, a father first, and then I wanted a capable statesman, because this is a new regime taking over. He's still the second most powerful person in this kingdom. And I'm just saying, why would a king, a new king, trust anybody that was bumbling or kind of foolish? Unless he wanted, you can make an argument, he wants control. And so he doesn't have to worry about that person. But I was, I was just interested in a really capable, strong um, uh, uh, figure in the play. That is a father who has raised two children on his own. The, his, his wife is gone. We, we don't know why, but imagine she, in our imagination, died in childbirth. So he's raised a young woman and a young man in this world of, uh, and so I was really interested in that dynamic. So what's the dynamic of a brother and a sister between each other who haven't had a mother that had been raised like that also? What is that dynamic? And, and because P Polonius is a re relative, is not relative, is a strong character in this play. Um, so what, you know, what's his flaw over that? But I, I think his tragedy is that he tries too hard is what I want him so capable, so in you know, that, once things start to get out of control, he, he tries even harder and harder, like a parent often will do, to, to try too hard with our children. And I think that's a lot what happens with them. 
he can just be an overbearing, you know, and this is a very strong patriarchal society. There's no question about that in this play, um, which is part of the pressure on Ophelia, which I talked about Ophelia. But what happened with Ophelia, with, uh, Elise Dickerson, who plays her, I directed her in the Scottish play in 2019 when I first got to know her. Very strong, strong actress, um, um, but she yeah, got a lot of heart. And so I was watching her one night, and for some reason Ophelia came to, Ophelia came to my mind. I said, I'd love her to be an Ophelia. And she's kind of, again, I'm sure somebody's done different Ophelias, but generally Ophelia is not a very strong, powerful force in the play as a woman with as, uh, in, in, uh, with as much agency as, this, as Elise has. But she and I talked, and I talked, but what, what if this is a strong, powerful woman with agency in her life, but she's only allowed to use that so far. So the pressure on her is she is not a weak wallflower. She's not somebody that listens to everything her father says and just, uh, you know, you can say yes, father. You don't have to mean it. You know what I mean? You can say yes, sir. You, you know, you can be, you can be great. You know, I'm not saying there's just all choices in that nuances of that relationship with her father. Um, which is all based on love, too. I wanted a family that really, really loved each other, a family that bonded together after that mother died, and a brother and sister that only really have each other, I think, in this world. That shows up in more places. I'd love to open that up just mm -hmm. a little bit than I usually see in this play. And part of it was when you talked about having Gertrude be a mom who's got a kid who's not well. Um, mm -hmm. There's ways that we as an audience can, can lean into that because we understand what that is. But I've also seen very little, the love between Horatio and Hamlet, the mm -hmm. way that shows up in this production with Horatio being played by Kelsey Brennan, who's an extraordinary actor, but that's not typically played by a woman. Certainly mm -hmm. in our, the past two productions here, it's been played by a male identifying actor. And also the love between, you see Rosencrantz and Guildenstern often portrayed a certain way, and the story makes them go a certain way, but I actually see some real affection, and it may be surface affection, the way young men can sometimes get to know each other, but my heart gets a little broken for, I can't remember, whoever Josh Krause plays. I get them mixed up, too. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I hope they that get he is there. really disappointed yeah. that his friend mm -hmm. is behaving that way towards him because of the love that's there. So the ways the ancillary stories, and with a performance as strong as I've, that Nate is per, the giving, that those stories that surround that central character are highlighted in a way. I would love to know if that was how you went in there with those actors, if that was your plan, or if that's something that evolved with this cast. It's a pretty extraordinary cast. No, well, I, I think I, I was very committed to having uh, all of the, if you ancillary or not so ancillary stories, be as vivid and have as much depth as the story of Hamlet, the character going through the play. Because I think how much more vivid Hamlet will be if everything around him is more vivid. Mm -hmm. So these are real relationships. So. Yeah, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, I think they're a horrible, terrible tragedy of innocence in this play. And they're often played, often with kind of um, being in the, uh, what's the word, you know, when the king, they're trying to get as much as they can from the king and know They're they, kind of stooges and they're like looking for what they can get. Yeah, yeah, and I was not interested in that. I was working well with their friends since childhood, as the, as the king says in his speech. Um, what's that like to have a friend of yours who you think is, Again, I kept coming back, what's the reality of someone that might have a mental issue? And that discomfort of trying to talk with them the first time and someone that you love and grew up with. And so what's the reality of that? I just pushed into that. Like, these are real friends really trying to help. And so I didn't really play that they're trying to get as much from the king as they can. Like, if they're successful, they're going to become courtiers or something. That's a valid way to approach it. Absolutely valid. And it just didn't interest me. I was more interested in these... Uh, young men doing their best and getting caught up in this and then uh, unfortunately suffer you know, a tragedy. They're completely innocent in the play. I think also the other, I mean, Claudius, Trini Sandoval plays Claudius in this production. And I, I hear those words differently because I see him playing so clearly. You'll remember the line, his love yeah. for Gertrude is, is in fact the, what is that line? Uh, she's so something to, she's... She's it's something that I think, as a star moves not, but in its sphere. But in its sphere. So I could not but by her. So some of those things, we have all have selective integrity when we direct, you know. <laughs> I, let's be honest. If you want to find something, you can find it in the play to support your vision. And, but so I, I did look and say, well, it says it right here that she is so conjunctive to my life and soul, he says, that as a star goes down in sphere, I can't. So I believe that. I believe he loves her dearly. 
Um, I'm not trying to make an excuse for the horrible thing he did, but this is also true. And uh, when Gertrude says, uh, he says of Gertrude, uh, his mother almost lives by his sight alone. So what's that? A mother that literally lives by the sight of their child. And we all know that, any of us that have children. Um, so again, I could, we would go back to base, you know, so in some of these iconic scenes, the closet scene and the, you know, all these things. But what, where's the mom? Where's the mom who she's looking at her son going like mad in front of her? It's like, you know, what do you do about that? Sorry. Uh, but if you can touch into those really, really things of it, I think it, it takes the kind of, oh, this, this is the to be and not to be speech. Mm -hmm. You know, and as much as we can get, and I'm not saying I'm 100% successful all the time, but as much as we can take an audience and hearing this for the first time, like real people really going through this, and all of a sudden you find yourself, oh, shit, we're in, that's, this is to be or not to be. Mm. And you just find yourself in it. That's the goal, at least. I'm not saying I'm always successful at it, but... Um, Before we open up to questions, and I'm sure that folks will have some, I'd love to talk, and we haven't, talked much about your work with Nate. And he is such a, um, an immediate, visceral, in-the-moment actor uh, that every time I see this play, I hear different things, and I see different things, because Nate is so alive. Um, well, he's well, such so damn good. It's just <laughs> I mean, infuriating just honest, sometimes. <laughs> He was two weeks in, and he's like the best. And I'm not just, it's not nothing to do with me. This is, he's a, he's a wonderful actor. And, uh, yeah. And we've watched him grow here as an actor. We, we all have. I, you know, mm -hmm. you 28 all have. years ago, it was me growing and watching. I directed him for the first time in Romeo and Juliet when he played Mercutio. And uh, I called him, it was like directing an eel. I could not get him to stand still. He was, you know, I couldn't hear a word he was saying. I, he was but good it was with so language, interesting. But it was so interesting, I never heard anything. But, but I saw him learn during that, as he learned to still himself and have more craft. I saw him learn in front of the audience the power of language. When he would say something, there would be a reaction. He was like, and I watched him grow over the years. And now he's far surpassed me in that realm. He's a brilliant actor. And a, a play like Hamlet, I think, it, this sounds really bad, like it's, a, it's not a personality role, but, but it is. It's whoever that human is doing Hamlet, be it a, a, a male identifying or female, or any, it, it is who that person is will come through in Hamlet. Hamlet serves everybody. Um, so there is not like a Hamlet out there, Derek Jacobi's or Ian McKellen's or, you know, my idols when I was a young boy growing up. Um, it is whoever it is, and, Ham and Nate has always been Hamlet to me. Nate is extremely intellectual. He's one of the best read people that I've ever known. He's deep, he's got such a heart. Um, and he's complicated and thoughtful. And he's, um, he kind of is <laughs> Hamlet for me. So to be honest with someone directing someone like that, a lot of it is staying out of their way. And I literally like give nudges like this, help me with this. I watch him and just encourage. And there's really no stamp of Hamlet I put on him at all. That is all his Hamlet. And I let it go, and I just, uh, I'm fortunate enough to watch that and to try and facilitate what he finds interesting. Of course, I'll often start with stuff if an actor does, you know, I have ideas to start with. But I always say my idea, this is a, a place from which to start or to depart from. So if you like this, go with it, run with it. You don't like it, well, give me a better idea. What do you got? That, go. I love it. Um, and that's the kind of way we build a show, at least in, in the rooms that I work in. And that's true with Trini and Colin, with all those actors in that play, that, that um, they're just, um, they're so good at what they do. And uh, so I like to just steal from them. And I'm not being humble. I do my work. I got a lot of stuff I bring into the room, but. How many books do you have? Oh, it's stupid. So we don't. I mean, no, we want to know. We heard about no. the bookcases. I, I don't know. I don't know. Literally cannot count as many books as he has. But, um, I saw you prepping for this. But I'm a, I'm a geek that way. I just like to have all that fuel, and a lot of it doesn't. But I got it there if somebody asks. Or, And again, I love the history about plays. So I love knowing that, okay, and it's just so stupid, but in 17, whatever, Garrett did this on this line. And it's kind of fun. And, and I. And I think it's this history that we feel. We can go all the way back to the Greeks, if you want, of 3,000 years ago, this, that we've passed things on to each other. And I kind of embrace that. I think it's wonderful. And uh, um, so, so again, Nate, we were talking about Nate, was a lot of just um, guiding him. Mm -hmm. And he created that character by himself. And 
And of course, that comes from what the, the, the bigger things that we put in it about family and the people around him and love and his mother. Because the queen can also be played as a very politically active figure. Um, uh, can, sometimes she's played a little colder to his son. And, like, and it's, again, which is a valid way to uh, look at the play. And we were just interested in something else. So when you have a different queen, then a Hamlet's going to react differently to that queen. Um, I love the idea of legacy or passing on the story and what we get to do here, both as an audience, as an you know, administrator, and as artists, is we get to grow along from your Hamlet into your Claudius into directing the next Hamlet. So even here, our own version of what they did in 17 such and such, we can think about yeah. Seeing, yeah. You know, seeing those pictures of Randy's Hamlet mm -hmm. and what, how that story has grown on our hill alongside many of you who've been with us all those years. I saw Randy's Hamlet, actually, in the Paps Theater when I was in school in Milwaukee with Lee Ernst playing the gravedigger. Mm. And uh, I remember I was just, I was still in, I was in school and I was like, who's that gravedigger guy? <laughs> and, uh, and I wound up meeting Lee years later. I tried to get in here, I auditioned twice and was not uh, accepted. And uh, I didn't get in here because I really desperately wanted to work here. I'd seen their work. They used to tour uh, uh, the, the Chekhov's and the, the mm -hmm. tobacco plays mm -hmm. and they would tour a show. And I was fascinated by Randy and this, this guy, Lee. Um, and then fortunately, some years later, Ken Albers got me in here. Um, again, I never got in here auditioning, they didn't want me, but, but Ken brought me in to play, uh, to, um, to play Romeo many years ago. And that got my foot in the door here. And then I met Lee and I was fortunate enough to work with him for a decade or so or more before he left. Now we're doing everything we can to keep you. Like just yeah, I, I maybe if I'm here a lot, maybe I could do the next Polonius. Or okay. Putting in a word. Anybody voting for that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'd like to see that. Um, I'd love to be able to take the next you know little bit of our time together to see if there are any questions from those of you who are here. I'm going to hand my mic off to Aaron. Or no? Yeah. Take his. Thanks. Oh, sure. It's a little. Aaron will help. Hi. It seems to me that they are essentially innocents in the sense that it's death by Hamlet. And I wonder what motivation you see for that and why it, why it happened. It, it seems to me almost malevolent because I, I don't see anything that they have done that deserves that. And I'd like your comments on it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And uh, the, the problem is Hamlet sends them to, to their death thinking he's in alignment with the king. So Hamlet steals a letter from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and inside that letter is asking England to execute Hamlet. And because they're, they're the ones bearing it, Hamlet assumes wrongly that they know it's in the letter. But the king just gave the letter to RNG and said, here, you take this and take Hamlet and get him to England. So um, they're under a lot of pressure, and you'll see in this production from the king, they have no choice. When the king says, you get on that ship with him now, and you give this letter to the king of England or whoever. So, yes, they are complete innocents. Uh, Hamlet assumes that they're in cohorts, cahoots, cohorts? Um, cohorts, cahoots. Cohorts, with, uh, whatever, with the king. And, they want, and uh, the moment, really, in our production is when Hamlet discovers that, well, he never discovers in the play that they were innocent. So we have that, the irony, we have the irony of that. So that tragedy hits us. Hamlet doesn't. doesn't and Horatio, too. You see Horatio getting that in this production. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when he, when he says, they are not near my conscience, which is a very famous line, because um, Horatio says, you mean Rosencrantz and Guildenstern go to it? They're, they're dead? And Hamlet says, yeah, they're not near my conscience. Now, you can play that a million different ways. You know? And our Hamlet, again, is a more complicated Hamlet. I think what I did, it was like, yeah, they're not near. I don't get it. They're not, you know, very, I, I, wish I, I wish I did uh, Nate's Hamlet. Uh, no, but Nate is dealing with it, you know, at that moment. He actually killed his two schoolhood friends. You know, maybe he did it in a, in, a, in a moment of passion on the boat when he had this idea and he just did it. But we have a moment in the play where he gets where Horatio's actually get. you mean you sent them to their deaths? And he has to deal with that in that moment. But again, in, in the play and in the script proper, he doesn't know that they're innocents. And not just Horatio, like everybody that, mm -hmm. at the end of this play, almost nobody knows anything like what happened. Mm -hmm. What the heck happened here? And that's why one of the last speeches is, let's all go into the, into the lobby room and, and I'll explain everything. This is basically one of the last uh, speeches in the play. 
because there's a ton of questions left at the end of the play. We, the audience, have the irony of knowing everything uh, that's happened, but the actual characters on stage, um, Horatio knows the most, but Horatio doesn't know everything. Right? To the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Yeah. Your comment about you know, nobody knowing anything, you maybe it was a good segue to my question. In your opening remarks, you said uh, Hamlet is a play masking itself as a revenge tragedy, but it's really a play about other things. What are those other things that you see that this play is about? Well, that's a, you know, I, I think on the surface, particularly at the time that Shakespeare, it, it could look like, oh, this is a traditional you know, uh, revenge tragedy. But within that, you know, I think Shakespeare being Shakespeare, um, we get these deeply psychological takes on the play. You know, there's, I don't know if there's a theme that you can say that's not in this play somewhere, mm -hmm. whether it be war or violence or masculinity or uh, female agency, patriarchal societies. You know, um, so you can embrace it just kind of as a revenge tragedy. But usually in a revenge tragedy, I think we kind of cheer for the revenger. At the end, I think we're cheering for Hamlet at the end of the play. We did, a, we did a wrong service to this play. I mean, there were eight people dead by the end of this play and because a young man chooses violence. And that violence leads to another act of violence, leads to another act of violence. And we get into a, not a revenge tragedy, but, but the tragedy of revenge, mm. uh, really. Uh, we, lose, we lose Laertes, this young, brilliant, you know, wonderful man, because he's out of passion. Um, to revenge his father's death. We, we lose this poor, you know, beautiful woman, Ophelia, that all the pressure of this and feeling that she's guilty partly for her father's death and all this pressure, we lose her. Um, so by that, I think it's, it's like, it's, it's, even, you know, it's like a, a murder mystery that has a very classic structure to it, but you get to go into all these other deeper things within it. Um, I'm not sure if that's very articulate, but... but. I just have, you know, when you're talking, I'll just... Yeah, it's a play about patriarchy, but it shows that patriarchy just doesn't affect women, and that Hamlet followed the orders of his birth father, and all of this crap followed as a result of it. Yeah, and he resists it for a long time, too, you know, and, and <laughs> it's, it's, the tradition is terrible, the Olivier film, which starts, it literally says, that it's a story about a man who would not make up his mind, <laughs> and, uh, um, which is... I guess true, but it's, it's so, you know, uh, I don't know, that's so, uh, it's so much more than that. Because Hamlet says, and he says, like, I think three or four times in the play, the spirit which I have seen may be the devil. And people really believe that then. Mm -hmm. It's hard for us to that may be the devil, and the devil had power to assume a pleasing shape. And yea, perhaps have my melancholy and, and sadness, as he's very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. He says, but I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play is the thing where I'll catch the conscience of the king. So it's not just not making up his mind. He's actually doing due diligence. Mm -hmm. Before mm -hmm. I step on this, because I talked to Nate, so what's it actually like to kill a human being? We, we do this in Shakespeare plays too. Oh, there's a ghost. Uh, oh, there's another sword fight and three people die. No, what's it actually like to ponder about killing a human being? And you don't have to do that. I'm just interested in that, because what it brings out in actors, I think, is fascinating. And even just seeing a ghost, which is, oh, there's the ghost scene, or there, there's the mad scene, you know, with the, the Scottish queen or with Ophelia. You know, what's, what's a real mad scene? It's horrifying, I think. It's terrifying um, to see a ghost. If I were to see my dead father behind all of you right now, really see a ghost? So first, I would either be insane, right, for any of us if we saw a dead relative, or, oh, my God, there is an afterlife. And all those things I don't believe in about Christianity or whatever, oh my God, they're true. Oh, you know, so, so there's Hamlet for you. Either I'm insane or this is real. So am I going to kill a human being on that prompting, though? Actually kill a human being. So, And I just said it because we kept on coming back to that because she can get lost in just the, the heroic kind of revenge part of it. Well, you keep saying, coming back to when you started talking about it, the for real real. No, really a mother, really a son, really a brother and sister, really a body, really. No, yeah. but re no, but really. <laughs> but you have to keep saying that sometimes in these classical plays where you have an idea of what it is. But no, but really. 
And that play does this a yeah, lot. I mean, Polony is saying goodbye to his son. I have a son who lives in Ecuador. Oh. Saying goodbye to my son when he was leaving for another country when he was 21. No, he was so older than that. Still 23 years old, going to live in another country. I said half the things that Polonius says. You know, neither a borrower nor a lender be. I didn't say it like that. I said, make sure you watch your money. Don't spend it all on crap. Don't, don't buy fast food. Buy from the stores. You can cook it. I did all that. You know, watch your drinking. It's, it's, it's all that. Mm -hmm. you have fun, you know, do a lot of stuff. It's, that's all in that speech. And we talked to Chike. This, this is not the iconic, you know, um, take, it's, it's not a famous speech. Mm -hmm. It's a father saying goodbye to his son and trying to give him, and not, maybe not knowing how to do it the best, but trying to give him some advice before he goes. And, uh, and we've all had seen saying goodbye to people that we love. And, uh, and what happens when you tap that into the, the wonderful actors like, you know, like someone like Chike, um, and I know, his, I know his children, I know his wife and his kids, I know what kind of dad he is. I know what it's like for him uh, raising his children. And uh, that's why I wanted him for the part, too. And, and we get dad there. Um, so we don't get a bumbling, um, old, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that negatively, because that is a very valid way to do the play. And it's more, it's more fun, although he still does have fun. But. Yeah, so. Other questions? So you mentioned something earlier about you know what does manhood mean, what does masculinity mean, um, and this is as I understand it, Helen is like thirty years old. Why is he not the king of Denmark at this point? Mm. It's never really addressed anywhere. And it, what does that say about him and the fact that Claudius is so unthreatened by another potential rival to the throne that he just keeps him around? Yeah, somebody said, if he just would have let him go back to Wittenberg, none of this would have happened. Because he says in the very beginning of the play, we, you know, we'd rather you stay here. And first bad move on his part. Um, we talked, again, there's no answer to this. You know, we, we, we have, again, selective integrity. We'll look at the text and make up what we want to make up. Mm. I know I have a daughter who's 24 on a PhD track. It's nothing to have somebody still in school when they're 30 years old. And she's, she's a... a a, forgive me, a wonderful geek. She loves studying and reading and talking about ideas. And I think Hamlet, this is not true. I make up, and we, I made this up with my Hamlet. He loves talking and reading and talking about big ideas, philosophy. And I don't know if he would make the best king. You know, I don't think he's on track for that. I don't know if he wants to be. You, you can play the opposite. You can play that he is really upset about having Claudius having stepped in between... Uh, uh, between his ascendancy to the throne. But this is a, the, the play, too. I've lessened this, but this starts with a, with, a, with a country possibly going to war. And I don't know if Hamlet would be the best one to put in, you know, a young man that has no military experience at all, who is a student, who is a philosopher. If he's the best person to have, you know, you need a wartime consigliere, as they say in The Godfather. Mm. So, um, and I think perhaps... In this play, and I, I think it's the script proves it again. But um, if, if we didn't know this play, um, Claudius is a really good king. He's handling this really well. He's the first king. He's not a medieval king, not like the last Hamlet, who fought one on one with uh, with Norway, fought a one on one battle to settle a dispute. That sounds really cool and exciting and sexy. No, you're 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 putting the fate of an entire nation on a one on one combat. It's ridiculous. Claudius comes into power and he says, we're going to use ambassadors. And he sends the two, the two highest ambassadors in the kingdom to try and talk to, about a peace so we don't have to waste people's lives and, all this, and, and the coffers, you know, all this money. So I think if you don't know this play, he looks like he's doing a pretty damn good job. And why is Hamlet so upset about him? And I think we should be thinking about that because if we get ahead of it and we know he's a villain... You know, um, it takes away from the, you know, from the naivety, the naive this listening of this play. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know that he would have been, and in the first speech, Claudius says, and he says he's married the queen, and, and uh, all of you people that went along with this, I just want to thank you for giving your assent, basically. So the council of the kingdom has gone along with this, too, freely. Uh, he uses the word, too, freely, freely gone along with this. He's wagging the dog a little bit, Claudius is a very, very, very smart politician. Um, but I wanted to embrace as much as, for, for, I ask the actors often, can you know as little as you can for as long as you can? 
So know as little about Claudius, you know, and there are exceptions to this, I'm sure, but as a kind of a general rule, like no less. Think he's, think he's good, so why is Hamlet so upset with this, this guy we should be thinking? I, okay, I know your dad has died, but, you know, um, so we get to learn, you know. I don't know if that makes any sense, to know less, know less than you can. Cause, again, I think it's from Ken Albers yelling at me, you haven't read the play, Davida. <laughs> you don't know how it's going to turn out. So apologize, apologizing to those of you who don't know the play, because we <laughs> didn't start Spoiler with. If you, let us know if you don't know the play. They um, all die. The, they all die. Uh, except when it rain, gets rained out. We do have a little conversation. We're like, Did they, who lived? Who lived today? Who lived? Everybody lived. They're going to die today. I have a good feeling about it all. Um, I'm so grateful for you being here. I've got a, we've got one more. If, it's a, we, if he can answer quickly. Hannah's wrapping us is, up. Is Hamlet really 30? I didn't know that. Yeah, there's, you can do the math of it. It's in the gravedigger scene, and the gravedigger says, well, I've been here since young Hamlet was born. And, and so, um, yeah, you can wind Most scholars agree he should be, he's about 30 in the play, which, which is interesting and really, you know, and yes. And so, okay. so not to linger on that, but you can work that math out. You know, okay. so. I didn't Thanks. know there was math. <laughs> you didn't know there was going to be math. It's mostly just scholars doing the math, to be honest with you. It's, it's not an issue when you're watching the play, because if you're doing the math with the grave digger, we've done a bad job. Yeah. So, Especially with David Daniel. Lot, there's a lot more else yeah. going on. There. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Th thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.